such a pleasure to have all of you here tonight for this very, very special evening with Mira Lochner. Um, I got fascinated with Zen Japanese gardens many, many, many years ago. And you are really, truly in for a treat with somebody who has thought and written about uh, Japanese Zen gardens for quite some time. And uh, one of our curators will do a proper introduction here in a minute. I just wanted to welcome all of you to our Global Speed Lecture. And as you know, with this gl Global speed, speed Lectures, we are taking you around the globe to different cultures. Uh, and this year, we are focusing on Japan, um, a phenomenal culture and an incredible country where there is so much to discover, so much beauty, um, so much deep philosophy about life and um, what it means to be human. And of course, the Zen gardens are um, an important aspect of Japanese culture and have been since the end of the 13th century when Zen Bo Buddhism came to Japan from China. Um, I personally love um, Japanese Zen gardens because they are um, spaces of contemplation, spaces where you certainly have the opportunity to um, delve deeper into yourself, and they are also places of experience. Um, and as somebody who has spent her life looking and thinking about art, Zen gardens are so special because they are so much about how the light changes during the day, but also how you move about in the space. Uh, and there are spaces um, that are tended to with so much care. And um, that caretaking is part of uh, the med meditative process itself. So I'm just so thrilled to have um, this incredible speaker here tonight. And I want to welcome all of you. And now, please, Scott, please help me introduce Mira Lox. Thank you, Rafaela, and welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you. I'm Scott Urbis, Curator of Decorative Arts and Design, and on paper, at least, the Curator of Asian Art, too. Um, just don't ask me too many questions about Asian Art. Um, I, I'm especially pleased to have Mira with us tonight. We owe her a special thank you. There's a long and winding road to get from Winnipeg to Louisville. Um, she made it here before the tornado yesterday, at least. Um, Mimi is an educator, author, and practicing architect who serves on the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Manitoba. She's a graduate of Smith College and the University of Pennsylvania, and was a practicing architect in firms both in the United States and Japan before she turned to academia. And prior to heading north to Winnipeg in 2021, she taught at Washington University in St. Louis, and also at the University of Utah, where she served as chair of the School of Architecture there. Um, Mimi's teaching and research focuses on design practices and processes, on community engagement through architectural design, and as we'll see tonight, on Japanese architecture and gardens. So this evening, she'll share with us her expertise on the latter, drawing on her two books on the subject of Zen gardens and Zen Garden Design. So please join me in welcoming Mimi to the stage. I forgot my one job that I was told to remember. Thank you, Scott. Good evening, everyone. They've got me th with the Brittany mic, so we'll see how this goes. It's so nice to be with you in Louisville. As Scott said, I am currently residing in Winnipeg, Canada. I left yesterday morning in a blizzard <laughs> and arrived about half an hour before the winds arrived here. So it was an exciting day yesterday. But today, tonight, we're going to make it a little less exciting, maybe a little bit more calm. And we're going to talk a little bit about Zen gardens in Japan. And uh, I, the subtitle here is Where the Mind Dwells, because gardens um, from Zen Buddhism were places of uh, mindfulness, of meditation, um, of being introspective. So what I'm going to do is start with a bit of history of um, landscapes in Japan, 
and then gardens, and then Zen gardens, and I'll show you two historic Zen gardens in Japan. And then the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk about gardens by Shunyo Masuno, who's a Zen Buddhist priest um, who currently lives and works in Yokohama and uh, designs gardens around the world. So I'll show you some of his gardens in the second half. Let's see if all the technology works. There we go. So here's Japan, archipelago, water's always present. It's a mountainous country. Uh, nature is very strong in Japan. There are typhoons, there are earthquakes, there are volcanoes. Um, it's a very beautiful country, very varied from um, east to west. Today, most of the, well, the historic gardens I'll talk about today are located in the city of, of Kyoto, right in the center, um, but there are gardens all around Japan. So I, th I always like to start from the country and um, thinking about how the cult Japanese culture developed. And when you live in a, in a beautiful landscape, there are moments in the landscape that you notice that are unique. And you start to give them a little bit of um, mythology, if you will, or spirituality, if you will. You start to imbue them with significance. And the same, of course, happened in the Japanese landscape. So here you see Mount Fuji on the left in the distance, um, some amazing rocks in the ocean on the right. And so our first, some of our kind of early um, ways of connecting to a landscape are through these unique places that we notice and, we, and that start to have a sacred quality for us. And in Japan, the, the vernacular religion or philosophy, if you will, is Shinto. And Shinto is animistic. Uh, it's very much connected to the place. There are many deities. They reside among us. And the way that Shinto sacred lands are marked on the left is a tori gate, which marks the entrance to a Shinto precinct, a sacred precinct. On the right is a shimenawa, which is this rope that marks a sacred place. So in this case, the waterfall is considered to be a, a place where a deity would reside. So the waterfall itself is not the deity, but the deity resides there. The Shimenawa lets us know that the space beyond it is sacred. And the Tori Gate lets us know that the space beyond it is sacred. And as an architect, these are both quite interesting to me because the Tori Gate doesn't stop anybody from passing through. And the Shimenawa is simply a line in space. If you didn't know any better, you could walk under it in this case. If you understand the significance of it, you know not to. Um, but these kind of signifiers of the, the, the change from the everyday world, the kind of profane world, to the world of the sacred, right, are really important in Japanese history. And I, I like to start by thinking about these different ways we mark the landscape and then thinking about how that connects into the gardens. So another way that we change the landscape is through agriculture. And in Japan in particular, rice farming and wet rice farming is a way that the landscape has been changed for centuries. And so here in the upper left, you can see rice paddies on a very steep slope because so much of the land in Japan <clears throat> is quite steep. Um, 75 to 85% of it is too steep to really build on easily. So that leaves 15 to 25% for everything else, right? For, for industry, for residential areas, for larger scale agriculture. So you see landscapes like this um, on steep slopes where people are making the most of the area that they have and terracing the land. And of course, because it's wet rice farming, the, the land, the rice paddies have to be bermed to hold the water in. So there's a significant alteration of the landscape here for the rice. And so in this, it, the, the three images, you can see the rice paddies flooded before they were planted on the upper left, and then on the upper right, a couple weeks after planting, where the paddies are still flooded, and then in the, the lower image um, after the harvest in the fall. And, and so these rice paddies also change seasonally. And so the beauty in the agricultural landscape over the seasons is also an idea that I want you to bring with you. And then over time, when we get settled and we're no longer 
just surviving, but we have a little bit of extra time and maybe a little bit of extra money and maybe a good sense of humor in this case, we do things like this. This is a circular rice paddy. If you've ever planted rice, you would know, and I hope you haven't had to do that, it's hard work, but you would know how difficult it is to do a circular rice paddy because when you plant rice, you've got some of the sprouted rice in your hand, you're up to here in mud, you're taking those sprouts and you're putting them in the mud and moving backwards, right? So how you do that in a circle takes some planning. So this is a way where we start to, again, alter the landscape. Yes, it's agricultural, but it's also for our own enjoyment. So these are just some, some background ideas that, that I like to think about when I'm thinking about gardens in Japan. Now, the very earliest gardens in Japan um, no longer exist, and they actually were highly influenced by gardens from China. So they came to Japan with Buddhism starting from the sixth century. And Buddhism was brought from China through the Korean Peninsula to Japan. Most people in Japan had never seen a Buddhist building, so they had never seen a garden that went along with it. And, and so the initial buildings, the Buddhist temples that were built in Japan were built by craftsmen from, mostly from Korea. Um, who had been building temples there. And so the gardens also were very much in the same style that had been used in China, moved through Korea, and then came into Japan. They no longer exist. However, we do have some that have been reconstructed based on archaeological digs and based on other historical research. So these early gardens were what are called stream and pond gardens. They had these winding streams that would open out into ponds. And you can see here how they had some kind of beachy areas with rocks. And they had pavilions, buildings that were in the gardens as well. And these were mostly pleasure gardens. These were gardens where people would noble people, aristocrats who had the money and the time, the resources to build these gardens could enjoy them for themselves. So these are the earliest gardens in Japan. The next phase, what we start to see that happens a lot in Japan is, is things are adopted from other places. A lot of, a lot of the cultural, um, the arts and, and uh, ideas were adopted from, again, from China. And then Japan starts to adapt them to the Japanese culture, the land, the land forms, the climate. Um, and then over time, they become quite adept and make them into something that we now consider to be fully Japanese. So this is now a transitional stage. Um, and at this stage, the type of Buddhism in Japan that was popular was pure land Buddhism. And the gardens were representing a paradise. So the early gardens really were for, for um, entertainment, for pleasure, and now we're moving into a paradise garden, still for pleasure, still being built by the aristocracy, um, but also having a, a Buddhist connotation now. And so in these gardens, we often see um, a pond with islands, um, with bridges going over to the islands. So there's this idea of a paradise beyond. Um, so if we do well in this life, we can move to the paradise in our next life. The, gar the buildings were designed, this building is actually called a shinden, and the name of this style is shinden zukuri, or shinden style. Um, and then it, there were these pavilions that, that moved out into the garden. There would be musicians sitting and playing in the pavilions, um, and people could enjoy music in the garden. Um, they could go boating in the garden. So it was a garden that was used, but used for pleasure, but also had the Buddhist connotation. There is one existing building from this time period in Japan. Hard to believe a building from the 11th century is still in existence, but it is, and it's open to the public. So if you have a chance to go, Uji is not far from Kyoto. Um, and Byodo in is, you can see just part of the, the former complex that's there, but this, this is the main hall, the Shinden, and then part of the garden is there as well. You do not visit Byodoin for the garden, you visit it for the, the, the historic building and also an amazing contemporary gallery um, that's set into the hillside there. But I wanted to share this with you just to let you know that there are some things in Japan that, that, have, um, that still exist for um, uh, over a thousand years. 
And in this, this Shinden style and moving forward in time a little bit now, we start to, again, see the connection between the architecture and the gardens. That was very, very important. Um, we, we start to see the, here's a boat, right, that's moving through the pond. We see areas where, that are white. So often on the south side of the buildings, that there would be an area that was covered with white gravel. And this started partly from Shinto shrine complexes where they would, in front of the shrine, lay out white gravel as a way to purify the area. But also in imperial residences, when they would have ceremonies, they had an area that they would cover with white gravel. So the thinking is that that is something that stayed on from those earlier uses and got incorporated into the gardens. So that was a very quick background. Um, we're now going to, to um, look at two Zen gardens in the city of Kyoto. Kyoto was one of the historic capitals. It's really the cultural, historic cultural capital of Japan. You could, you could go to Kyoto and visit a Japanese garden every day for a year and still not see all of the gardens. There are so many gardens in Kyoto. Okay, so the first garden that I want to show you is, is Ginkakuji, um, also known as the Silver Pavilion. The grandfather of the uh, person who built Ginkakuji built Kinkakuji, which is the Golden Pavilion, which is covered with gold leaf. Ginkakuji, the silver pavilion, never got covered with silver leaf, um, but it, it's quite lovely nonetheless. And um, Ginkakuji is a little bit of a transitional garden. So it maintains some of the aspects of the pleasure gardens. You can move through it and walk through it. And then it also have, has now starts to have aspects of Zen gardens. So this garden was built by um, a noble person, a politician, who upon retirement uh, left the political capital to retire, but really to um, try to bring his political power to one place. Um, so leaving the capital was a political act, this idea of retirement. In retirement, um, eventually these noble people would take on a Buddhist name um, and their homes would become Buddhist temples. So this is now a Zen Buddhist temple, originally built as an aristocrat's home. And I'm gonna walk you through it and I've put these red arrows in to show the path. So it has an incredible approach and then moving through one gate to a small garden and then moving out. And then I'll show you these very amazing um, forms made out of a kind of a granite sand. And then um, and they actually were a later addition. There were, had been a different building here that burned down and those were added later, um, which is kind of an interesting way to change the garden. And then we move through the garden, move up, and then come up to the top of a hill, look back down on the garden, and then move back down. That's how you move through the garden. I won't show you every single detail, but I'll show you a little bit of the interesting point. So here's this entrance, this approach. So think about the, the Tory gates and how the gate signifies a, a change from the, the profane world, the everyday world, to the sacred world. This approach, in a sense, does the same thing for you. When you walk through, the hedges are quite high. They're not exactly the same from, from left to right. You can see a hedge, a bamboo fence, and then a rock foundation. On the other side, the same rock foundation, but a double hedge, right? So a little bit different on right and left. You come in, so this is where the, these are taken, but you come through, you look down, and at the end, all you see is, the, is the, the wall continuing, right? So you're in a very focused space as you're moving into the garden. Then once you come in and move through, you first see this garden, which is a raked garden, a small courtyard garden. And then you move through and come out and you're given this view of very unusual forms in the garden. So these were added in um, a couple of hundred years later, but even so, they're very contemporary in their style. So it's quite amazing to think that these have been there for a couple of hundred years. Um, they are raised beds of, of a kind of a granite sand, and whereas this is on the ground, these are raised above the ground. This one is in a cone shape. Often people say it refers to Mount Fuji. 
There are other theories about it. One of my favorite theories is that that's where they piled the sand when they were doing this other one and they <laughs> liked it, so they left it, right? So, you know, just shaped it a little bit. I kind of like that theory. It's probably not accurate. Um, but it is very interesting how these two mounds really balance each other out. They're quite different from one another in their, in their um, shape and in their, um, one is more vertical and cone shape, the other one is a little bit flatter, but very amorphous in its shape. One is raked, one is just has a very smooth surface, but they really balance each other out. And the reason for the sand mound is to reflect the moonlight. So this is really, um, and because it's made of a, out of a granite sand rather than a pea gravel or a regular sand, it almost uh, reflects silvery, right? So this is, a, this is a place where you, if you could, um, come in the evening and really see the, the moonlight reflecting off of the sand mounds. In the distance, this is the silver pavilion itself which is architecturally a bit of an anomaly. It was a bit of a folly. The, the style of the ground floor is different than the style of the upper level. So it was just built as, some, as a kind of pleasure pavilion within the garden. And as you move through the garden, the scenery really changes quite dramatically. Um, so here, as we're in the lower level, you can see these beautiful bridges and lanterns. So there are things in the garden that really show the mark of the hand of man right, that the, the stone has been carved to form the lantern. Um, the, obviously, the arc of the bridge is something that was man-made. But the garden is designed to be natural, to be as naturalistic as possible, sometimes even to be more perfect than nature. And so you see lots of, of different plants and trees. In some cases, they were brought from long, great distances to be there. Um, again, this was a, a noble person's garden, so they had the means to bring in things from, from many different areas throughout Japan. Um, but you wander through and the garden opens up and the garden changes as you're moving through it. There would be reference in references in many of these gardens to geographic places um, in Japan or perhaps in China. Um, if you at that time period, you might know those references. These days, we have to read it in the guide to know what the reference is, right? But people, learned people of that time would have known. But as you move through the garden here, every scene changes and the path leads you through and guides you through so that you have these different views as you're moving. And then as you get up a little bit further, you can see the arrow at the top, there's this kind of mysterious stair that leads you up the hillside. And it's very interesting because the whole time you're wandering slightly uphill, but there are so many things to look about. You're not really paying attention to the fact that you have um, gone up in elevation. And then you get to the top and you get this wonderful view back over the garden and these lovely mountains in the distance. And this is, this is a principle called shake or borrowed scenery. And you can imagine at the time that this was built, um, all of these houses and buildings that we see here were not there. It was just countryside. And so you would have had this wonderful view back out over your own land and then the mountains in the distance and that becomes part of your garden. So chake, borrowed scenery. And then as you, you move back down, so this is the view from the top, you move back down and you get a view again of, of the pond and of the golden pavilion itself. So this is a garden that you're really meant to walk through and to enjoy slowly as it unfolds, as the different scenes unfold as you're moving through it. So the next garden I'm going to show you um, is Ryoanji, which is quite famous. You've, many of you have probably been there. Um, I hope if you've been to Ryo, Ryoanji, I hope you've also been to Ginkakuji. Um, and Ryoanji is um, known as a dry rock garden. So many people, when they think of Zen gardens, think Zen gardens are all dry without many plants, um, but that's not necessarily the case. There are often many plants in Zen gardens. But that famous garden is just this little piece right here. And there's all this other area that is garden that, that is uh, part of the Ryoanji temple complex. So let's, let's visit Ryoanji. So as you're moving into the complex, there's a beautiful pond with an island in it, um, with a bridge that crosses over to the island. Does this ring a bell, 
right? So these are elements that have been around for a long time that are still being used in these gardens. You can see, in this case, some really lovely azaleas um, in bloom. And there are pines and there are other um, trees and plants that flower or, or have leaves that change color over time. So every season it's quite different. So it's lovely to visit in different seasons and you can enjoy it different ways. And eventually you get to these nice stairs that bring you up um, toward the, where the uh, small courtyard garden is. But first you have to pass inside. Um, if you are a noble person, you would have gone in through this very fancy entryway. Um, these days, we're all taken off to the side to get in, but that's okay. And then you move through the building. So you actually have to go in, you have to remove your shoes, um, step up a couple levels so that you're on a, on a, a platform that's about this high, this that I'm standing on, and you see these lovely spaces that you experience before you then move out into the garden. And this is what the garden looks like. It's pretty simple, it's not very big. It's just a bunch of gravel with some rocks in it. It's a little more than that. It's quite amazing, actually. There are 15 rocks that are in sets of two or three that are interspersed throughout the garden, well, throughout the area of the garden. There's rake gravel. This is a pea, white pea gravel um, that surrounds it. It has this really incredible wall on two sides, so here and here, that is made of clay that was boiled with oil. And so what you're seeing is the patina of the wall, the kind of oil starting to seep out, and that's why you get this color. There's a, another wall on this side that, that is here, um, which is covered with lime plaster, so it's white, so it's very different. And then on the fourth side here, where this image is taken from, is a veranda. So you're up off the ground about, again, it's about this high, but you're sitting, and it's important that you sit because these gardens are designed to be viewed from a seated position. And you're raised off the ground, there's a roof over your head, you're sort of inside, but you're not completely inside because there's no wall in front of you. So you're in this inside-outside space. There's more interior space behind you, and you are able to sit and view the garden. And this garden holds many mysteries. One of them, as a joke, is that the men's restroom is here and has a lovely view out onto the garden, and the women's restroom has no view. So I don't know who designed that, but, but it does hold many mysteries. And one of them is that there are 15 rocks, but from any position seated along the veranda, you will never see more than 14. One of them is always hidden from view. Now, if you're seated on the left, which would be down here, and then you move to the right and sit there, the rock that you couldn't see on the left side will be revealed to you, but there will be others that will be hidden. So any vantage point, you will never see all the rocks. This is a meditation garden. And so the idea is, as you are sitting and meditating, even if you can't see everything with your eyes, if you spend enough time practicing in meditation, you will understand the garden fully with your mind. So Zen is a lot like that. You might be familiar with the kind of ink brush painting that is a circular single stroke that doesn't quite come together at the end, right? So it's, it's not a perfect circle, but in our minds we see it as a circle. We understand it as a circle, even though it's incomplete. Our mind can complete it. So this type of Zen garden, which is a meditation garden where you sit and view the garden, is really about letting your mind complete the picture. And it's, it's not just the picture about the garden, obviously it is understanding the garden, but it's also understanding yourself. It's, it's as Shunyo Masana likes to say, you come face to face with yourself in the garden. So here you can sit and meditate on the rocks. We don't know how large they are. Maybe they're, maybe we're seeing 90% of this rock. Maybe we're seeing 50% of that rock. But again, as you spend time with it, you will get a better sense of the full. 
Another trick in this garden is it's quite small. However, it really represents a vast, vast space. And it does that through layering of space. So uh, in your inside, your inside outside, you have many different layers happening on the ground plane. You have the raked gravel and again, many layers. And then you also have the borrowed scenery beyond. So you have lots and lots of layers of space that makes you think the garden is larger than it is. But there's also another trick that the designer did. This wall, and we're seeing it in perspective, so we know when I look at this room, it's th it feels like it's this big here, and it gets my eye sees it as, as it's fading into the distance. But I know in my brain that it, the wall is the same height from front to back. So when you look at this, you think, OK, this looks taller just because of the perspective. This looks shorter just because of the perspective, but that wall is really the same height, except it's not. It's actually, it actually does get lower as it moves away, and that forces the sense of perspective so that, again, you feel like that space is much grander than it really is. So there are some visual tricks here that the designers did that, that uh, really affect the way that you see the garden and understand the garden. So here are just some details of the garden. Um, this is a little collage that I put together so you get spring here and winter here um, because the garden is so different in the different seasons, right? That, that borrowed scenery beyond the wall changes dramatically when the cherry trees are in bloom versus when the maple leaves are bright red. And so it's a garden that if you have the opportunity to visit at different seasons, you really must. It's, it's quite fabulous that way. So now I'm going to switch into Shunyo Masuno's gardens. So as I mentioned at the beginning, Shunyo Masuno is a Zen Buddhist priest. Um, he's also trained as a landscape architect, and he's based in Yokohama. Um, as far as I know, he is the only Zen Buddhist priest garden designer living in Japan today. Um, Zen priests at one time historically did design gardens and were known as garden designers. And it is something that um, was passed through the ages. But over time, other people design gardens too. And sometimes they were tea masters. So tea, the, the art of tea is also very closely related to Zen Buddhism and ideas from Zen Buddhism. Um, so these were people who were masters in these kind of aesthetic um, pursuits. Um, that made me, they also would design gardens. But we also know that some of the people who design gardens were not priests and were not um, uh, people who could afford to spend their time um, enjoying uh, designing tea ceremonies and the gardens to go along with them, but they were actually laborers. They were the ones who laid the rocks. They were the ones who created the ponds and the streams, and their names are often not known. Um, Ryoanji was actually, they think, designed by laborers. Right, so they were, they were, in Japan historically, there was almost a caste system where there were the untouchables, and they were the ones who were left doing all the, the labor nobody else wanted to do, and, but that included laying the rocks. And so some of them who became quite good at it are thought to have been some of the designers of gardens. So Shunyo Masuno follows in the tradition of Zen Buddhist priest garden designer. Um, and again, I think he's the only Zen Buddhist priest garden designer in the world today. Um, certainly in Japan. So he talks about, in his own work, wearing two pairs of straw sandals. The straw sandals are the traditional footwear that people in Japan wore. And, and for him, um, this, this is his role as the head priest of Kenkoji Temple in Yokohama and his role as a landscape architect and a garden designer. So he um, finished his education in 1975 from Tamagawa University. Um, and he, he finished in the Department of Agriculture where he studied landscape architecture. And then four years later in 1979, he began his Zen training. His father was the head priest at Zen at Kenkoji Temple. So he really didn't have a choice um, but to follow in his father's footsteps. So he did his Zen training, which is quite strict. And then in 1982, so three years after that, he, he started his landscape architecture firm. Um, and then in, in uh, 1985, he became an assistant priest at Kenkoji Temple. So you can see how he keeps 
changing his straw sandals, right, between being a landscape architect and being a Zen Buddhist priest. Um, and here you can see him um, in his robes and then also on a, on a construction site where he's helping to lay a piece of, of um, granite. And for Masuno, the garden, the designing of the gardens and the construction of the gardens is very much tied to his training in Zen. So for him, it is part of his uh, daily exercise in Zen Buddhism. It's part of his background and training in Zen Buddhism to do the designs and to do the construction. He, he does not see them as separate. So Zen Buddhist priests work a lot physically as part of their training. And so Masano starts his day by cleaning the floors of the temple main building, and then he begins his design work as part of almost like a meditative practice. So it's Masano who says, the garden is a special spiritual place where the mind dwells. And, and when I show this quote, I like to show this garden, which is actually um, from a museum in Ottawa. It used to be called the Museum of Civilization. Um, and there's a very funny story that goes along with this. When Masano was invited to the design the gardens that are on the terraces outside of this museum, he visited Ottawa in February. Yes, so if it was a blizzard in Winnipeg in April, you can imagine what Ottawa's like in February. Um, he came, he came direct, was taken directly from the airport to the site, didn't have a lot of time, wanted to get started. He was in his priest's robes. They showed him the site. He said, great. They said, we'll take you to the hotel now. And he said, no, I'll stay here tonight. And they said, you can't stay here tonight. It's freezing. It's below freezing. No, I'll stay here tonight. And he insisted. And of course, the folks from the museum who picked him up were thinking there was going to be an international incident of, you know, <laughs> Japanese Zen Buddhist priests fr frozen in the garden. So they went back the next morning. And he excitedly greeted them and said, I've designed everything. He had all the drawings, all the sketches, and he had drawn out the rocks he wanted to place in the garden. And he had estimated their weights. Then he said, let's go find the rocks. So they started driving around into the countryside to try to find rocks for the garden. And eventually they found some and, and made um, got permission to remove them from people's private land and brought them back and weighed them. And he was within a couple of kilograms for every single one. And to me, this just goes to show if you spend a lot of time really focused carefully on your craft, you get to know it well, right? And you're able to do things like that. So it's not really a superpower, but it certainly seems like a superpower to me. Um, so, Masano also talks about how there is no form for Zen. Zen is, is more of a philosophy or a way of life, and so it really doesn't have a specific form. So how then do you create Zen gardens if Zen doesn't have a form? Or how do you do a Zen painting if Zen doesn't have a form? So there are some um, characteristics of Zen aesthetics that people have um, scholars have, have put together over time. And this, in particular, from Shinichi Hisamatsu, who wrote about Zen and the fine arts. And he identified these seven characteristics that he said are um, something that result from the design process and from the designer's kokoro. So kokoro, it means mind, but it also means heart, and it also means spirit, right? So even though it's often translated as mind, and, and in the translation of Hisamatsu, they use mind, I'd like to remind everyone that it's not just about mind, it's really about heart and it's about spirit as well. And so things like asymmetry and simplicity, right? These are things that, that are a little bit easier to understand. Some of these like austere sublimity, lofty dryness, right? A um, little bit harder to, to understand or freedom from attachment, how do you, understand that aesthetically, right? So um, a lot of these are connected to Buddhism and particularly connected to Zen Buddhism as well. So it's part of the kind of detachment of the mind from the everyday world um, that is, is tied into some of these concepts. 
not going to go through the concepts, but I wanted to bring them to you as a way to start for you to understand um, some of the, the principles that you see in the gardens relate very much to this. Um, so here is Masano up here helping to place the stones. Um, and he talks about how the gardens have different expressions, power and calmness and tranquility, elegance, um, but it's really based on the arrangements of the rocks in the gardens. And when he arranges rocks, when any designer arranges rocks, they really must have a conversation with the rock. They have to understand what it wants to tell them about where it wants to be. And a lot of this is based on how the rock was in nature. So if a rock was found vertically in nature, you would never lie it on its side. You would always want to keep it vertical. Rocks are thought to have faces. So there's a, there's a, a, a side of the rock that wants to be shown. Some rocks are quite powerful and, and are often known as, as um, like a, a king rock. And a king rock would never be set alone. A king always has to have assistance. So there would be other rocks that are quieter that would be set with the king rock. So rocks then start to support each other. So you have a powerful rock and then you have supporting rocks. It's all part of that conversation. So I'm gonna show you a few of, of Masuno's gardens and I'm gonna start with some courtyard gardens. So Yoanji, that's small, not so small, but that, that's a courtyard garden. Um, Masuno's courtyard gardens are often quite small, but revelations, large revelations sometimes occur in small spaces. And it's that shift of scale where you're, you have a small courtyard garden um, where the way that the garden is designed is meant to represent something much larger than it actually is, just like the Ryoanji garden really represents the cosmos in a small space. So that shift of scale that your mind does um, can really bring you to revelations. And again, Masano would say, these are revelations about yourself. So this is a, a garden in the north part of Japan, the northern island of Hokkaido. Um, gets lots of snow. And actually, when Masano visited, um, the courtyard was filled with snow. Um, they had no garden in it. It was just in this empty courtyard space at that time. It's not empty anymore, but it was filled with snow. So he designed a garden called Chosetsuko, or the garden for listening to the falling snow. And it's very simple. You can, see, you can understand it as it's connected to Ryoanji with rocks placed within a raked gravel courtyard, um, but fewer rocks, much smaller space, and it's viewed in different ways. So the view that we have, oops, sorry, the view that we have, uh, try that again, there we go, um, here is where the arrow is, and that's the first view you get of the garden. So you move into, this is a hotel, you move into the hotel, um, and then you move into this space where you get this first view of the garden. Um, but, but the garden is designed not just to be viewed from um, that eye level, but also from a lower level. And, and actually you can see there's a quite low window here where if you're seated, you then have a view into the garden. So it's viewed from three sides. And so the garden has to be designed to have a balanced composition no matter where you're looking at it. So it's not a single view, but it's really viewed from 270 degrees. And you can see the, here you can see how carefully it has to be raked. Um, so that's something that the hotel has to maintain um, and they do a nice job of it. Another courtyard garden, this one is called the Jihi no Niwa or the Garden of Compassion. It's actually at a crematorium. I'm gonna show you two other gardens from this crematorium um, as well, but very small space and it's along a corridor. So here you can see the edge of the corridor and then there's glass. Very simple, very contemporary, right? So the rocks are not in their natural state. You can see um, you can see some of the drill marks from where they were quarried. You can see where they've been cut um, and, and uh, not quite polished, but they definitely have a flat surface and a few plants, right? So this is really just a small garden that uses rock and just a few plants to really um, create a space that, again, feels larger than it actually is. So now we're going to move to 
what I like to call scroll gardens. I'm not the only one who calls them scroll gardens, but these are gardens that you sit and you view and they open out in front of you like a scroll painting would open out in front of you. So they're not gardens that you walk through, but they're gardens that you view from, a, from, a, um, from outside. Um, and again, just a, just a sort of reminder that, that even though these are gardens have form, um, for Masano, he doesn't want to emphasize the idea of form. Really what he wants is, is for people to spend time there and to observe the garden intently. And through that act, um, to really start to think and use it as an opportunity to think and to wonder introspectively. So again, to think about themselves. So this is a garden at that same crematorium this is actually the first view when you walk into the crematorium. And in Japan, um, when someone dies, they are cremated. And as part of that, the family is invited to a special ceremony where they use uh, special, very long chopsticks to remove some of the bone and things that are left after the cremation, and they take that home with them. And, and, and that is sort of that moment of saying goodbye to their loved one. And so, coming to the crematorium needs to be a very special process for them. And so here is this amazing view of the tabidati no niwa, or the garden for setting off on a journey. And what Masano has done here is created this movement from front to back so that, again, you get this sense of distance and a sense of time. Um, and in the foreground, you can see there's greenery, there's a tree, and then in the background, you can see it turns into a garden with very few plants. So there's this sense of movement through the garden in, in the forms, but also in the way that the, the um, plantings are, are done. And the drawing of the, the garden, you can see here on the left. So that image I just showed you was from there. Um, so you enter in and then you would move along this corridor where you have no view of the garden and into the back and then you would wait here while the body was cremated and the ceremony takes place here and then you would get a view into the second garden which i'll show you in just a moment so the arrows that don't have tails are are where you'll see other views um, and the arrows that have the tails are the views that i'm showing you so here again the front part of the garden right with the with the moss and the other greenery, and then moving to the back, um, we start to see just the, the dry garden. And this is the garden in the back. So the two gardens are separated by a wall, so you don't get a view of the second garden until you have moved through, you've done the ceremony, you come out, and then you're greeted with shoka no niwa, or the ascension garden. And this one is incredibly contemporary in its form, right? So very different, a very strong contrast to the garden in the front, which really builds on traditional Japanese gardens. Um, you can see polished granite, perfect circle, but one rough rock that's set into it. And again, it's, it's, you're, we're viewing, actually viewing from the side here, but the first view of it is just a low, long view, which is this view. So that's that first view. So very dramatic view. And the idea here is, is to allow your feelings to be released, right? So after you've gone through something that's emotionally very difficult, that this is this moment where your feelings get released. So next I wanna show you another garden that is a scroll garden that you don't move through but that you sit and you view. And this is the garden um, called Ryu Monte or Dragon's Gate Garden at Gionji Temple um, in Ibaraki, Japan. And it is bounded on two sides by walls and then on the other sides by a building. So it has a set space, but it is really designed and the gravel is raked in a way as if it is flowing from here through the garden and out and around. So you get this sense of movement through the garden and it moves out beyond kind of what's visible to you. So you don't see where it starts and you don't see where it ends. And so we have this view looking out onto a rather square rock 
which is a little bit of a contrast, a kind of counterposition to the more organic and more natural forms of the garden. And often elements are put in gardens to kind of make you think about why they're there, right? And this is one of those elements. And then the other parts of the garden are very much in the kind of traditional style. So you see these incredible rock formations, this idea of, of a waterfall, a bridge over the water. Um, rocks are often meant to represent mountains or craggy cliff sides. Um, and so they're, it's understood in these gardens that they represent something maybe other than what they are, but at the same time, we understand that they are rocks, right? And it's the same thing with some of the plants and gardens. We often see azaleas clipped to represent a hillside or a mountainside, but yet we also understand them as azaleas, um, particularly when they're in blossom. So they are both things at the same time. So we see, we see that in this garden. And here are a couple of other views, and you can see, again, how carefully raked the gravel is and raked around the different stones. And you can see how the, the garden is built up along the wall um, in, the, in the back of the garden. And then there's a hedge that serves as a wall along the side of the garden. So Masno creates a kind of topography. Not everything is flat all the time, but he changes and builds it up so that, again, you get that sense of space expanding and you also get the movement in the garden. So that the gravel that is on the ground plane that shows movement almost like water flowing, but then you get the, the spatial movement in the vertical direction as well. So the third type of garden that I want to show you is what I call a stroll garden. Um, and it is... Um, for moving through, so strolling through. And, but I want to remind you before we see some of these gardens, um, this is actually one that Masno designed in Berlin, Germany, but he wants people to view the garden um, and themselves as one. It's the same thing. And he wants you to know that things in the garden are as they seem. So the rocks, the trees, the water, everything is there as itself. So it's itself, but yet sometimes it's also representing something else. So this is a garden um, that's quite amazing. It's at a hotel um, and it's called the Garden of the Great Waterfall and Pine Trees. And the view that I'm showing you on the left is from an upper terrace of the hotel looking down over the garden. And here is the Great Waterfall. And the Great Waterfall is right in front of a lower level of the hotel that has a restaurant. So if you're in that restaurant, you just see water falling. It's really quite powerful and quite amazing. And if you're out in the garden, you hear that water falling, right? It's loud. Um, but the garden's also quite large, as you can see. So here's the big waterfall right here. There are smaller waterfalls. There are bridges. There are paths. Um, so there are many different elements in the garden, and again, it as, as the earlier ones that we saw do, it changes as you move through. So the scenes open out and change as you move through. Um, so here you can see one of the smaller waterfalls, um, some of the incredible granite bridges. This is over gravel. So sometimes there's real water that you're passing by or over, and sometimes it's something that represents water. Um, but again, the, the scenes really change dramatically. It also has in this case here are some beautiful flowering azaleas, um, has a weeping cherry tree. So there are different things that will bloom at different times of the year that will also change the way that the garden is understood. Um, you know, incredible use of rock in the garden um, and in many, many different ways, some more rough and some more refined. And then I want to show you here um, that this garden that is in Tokyo um, called Kanzate or Sit Quietly Garden. And this is actually a quite interesting garden because part of it you don't move through, but part of it you can move through. And so the front part that we're seeing here, you're meant to view from the lobby and the restaurant. So this is the hotel. Um, this is the edge that, that separates inside from outside. Masano also designed, you can see a bit of this wall. He designed these walls and a center kind of sculptural piece. Um, and then he designed the garden. And so here's the garden that you view. And then where these arrows are, you can move into the back part of the garden. This is in a neighborhood in Tokyo. And he wanted to give something back to the neighborhood. So that back part of the garden that you can walk through is actually for the neighbors to enjoy. 
Um, and then the guests at the hotel um, sit and enjoy the garden in the front. And this is a quite contemporary garden. He uses a lot of light um, to really create these dramatic effects at night because people see it at different times of the day. He uses an inordinate amount of granite um, that really is used in these different terrace levels that shows movement throughout the garden. Um, and you can see how that's done here. Um, and then, then granite, not just in for these kind of strips, um, but also rough granite and more like a gravel here. And then, then he cuts through. And this, this idea of cutting is something that we see sometimes in, gen, in Zen aesthetics, this idea of cutting, something that is um, shocking to you or different, that cuts through and changes the way you see that. I liken it to if, you're in, if you do Zen meditation, the master comes with a wooden stick and wraps you on the shoulder to kind of force you into that next level of meditation. It's a bit like that, this idea of cutting. And then this is the back garden, right? This garden that is open to the neighbors um, to move through. And it, it's quite different in form and much um, very contemporary and very lively. So here for this just last image, um, this is actually uh, the garden, this is on the fourth floor level at the uh, Canadian Embassy in Tokyo, and it represents the, the um, geographic landscape of Canada. Um, but here, Masno talks about how Zen is really a way of discovering how we, one should best live. And when you view a garden, um, you should question yourself whether you're walking the correct path. And searching for an unmoving truth inside the garden, which he sees as a place where serenity and calmness are reclaimed. And the delusions and the answers are all within ourselves. So I will leave you with that. And I think there's a microphone in the back if anybody has any questions. Do does anyone have, a, we have time for a couple of questions, if there are any. I think maybe with Zen, we just need to sit and think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of have uh, one question I was uh, curious about, where you, uh, probably about halfway through, you were talking about the, uh, the king stone, or the king rock. Yes. And certain one, the importance of the rocks to uh, nature, the natural landscaping, and how all this uh, happens. And it's important that they keep the same uh, form or, or orientation, orientation when yes. they get in your garden. And so, uh, especially in a culture as uh, ancient as Japan, and I spend a lot of time going through the woods, you know, so after a big storm, things uh, shift and, you know, trees fall down. Like and, yesterday. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Creek will get eroded. And you might see a really big rock, and it might take 10, 15, 20 years, but at some point that rock falls over. If you observe that rock, then like, it might be, uh, you know, that would have stayed like a thousand years old for 999 years. It was upright, and then it falls over, and you see it, and you go, oh, I, I, man, I want this for my garden. You're, then, so it seems kind of odd that you're going to protect or attach that special significance to the orientation of the rock. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if the, the rock, rock, if the rock fell over naturally through natural forces, uh -huh. then you can use it lying down, right? So if you, if you found it and it had already fallen over through the wind, uh -huh. it's fine to use it lying down. It's only when you find it upright then you would not shift it. But nature can shift it, right? So, yes, so nature, the power of nature is more important than the power of humankind. Time for Thank two you. more questions here. How did you get interested in Zen gardens? Well, I spent, about, I spent seven years in Japan working for an architecture firm and was fortunate to have the opportunity to do a lot of traveling and see a lot of the amazing gardens in Japan. And um, so I studied them just to get to know them a little bit. And then, um, then I was contacted by Shinyo Masano, 
and he asked if I would write about his gardens. He wanted to do a book in English. And um, then I had to do a little more studying um, and, and spend a lot of time talking with him and learning from him. And, and I'm by no means an expert when, I, when you see the knowledge that he has, right? And you, you know, but um, it's been a lot of fun to try to learn a little bit about them. And, um, and I am still learning. And, and uh, actually, the, the bit about the rock falling over was something um, I learned just recently. Um, but yeah, it's, it's actually written in one of the old, very ancient garden texts that, you know, if nature fells the rock, then you can use it on its side. Thank you. One question over here. Yeah. The rake design seems very important. Uh, who designs it? Who rakes it? And how often? Yes. And do the people who rake it get to decide how the design goes? So most of the rake gardens, the design doesn't change. Um, and historically, the raking would have been done by the, the monks at the temple if it was a garden at a temple. If it was a garden for a, you know, a private garden, then there would have been someone hired to do the maintenance on the garden and the raking. Um, the design would have, whoever designed the garden would have chosen the rake pattern. Um, when they were raked by the monks, it would have happened daily as part of their meditation and their daily kind of ritual work. Uh, these days, uh, often they are raked by professionals who, who take care of the gardens. The, the new laborers, right, who are actually paid for their work, paid well for their work, thank goodness, um, and they rake them when needed, so after a strong rain or something like that, but certainly not every day. There are still some temples where the gardens are raked daily by the monks. The pattern does say the same. I do know one temple, uh, Honanin Temple in Kyoto, which has two raised sand beds. So not, not gravel, but sand beds, and not the granite sand that uh, Ginkakoji has, but kind of a yellowish sand. Um, and the pattern on them changes seasonally. So in cherry blossom season, it's cherry blossoms. In the rainy season, it's water, right? And so that one does change. And I have seen monks raking it, um, but they do not do it daily. Um, and sometimes they don't do it after a heavy rain when they need to, but um, they do it with re some regularity. Yeah, thank you. All right, I have time for one more. You're welcome to ask Mira some questions afterwards. Did you Can you stand the stone back up after it's fallen? Oh. <laughs> um, you probably could and, because and it was can a. Can you if, shuffle through a rake garden? No, you don't dare step through step on a rake garden. Yeah. No. So that's another one of those that there's. A, it's like a signifier, like the shimenawa, the rope, the Shinto rope, right? Like you, if you understand the the kind of culture of the garden, you know not to walk through it. Right. So the only people who could walk through it would be the, the monks who were doing the raking. Yeah. Good question. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, and thank you, Mimi. So look, look for our next talk in this series will be in October. We'll be bringing in Janice Katz from the Art Institute of Chicago to talk about Japanese woodblock prints and their connection to Frank Lloyd Wright. So hope you'll enjoy that. Thank you. <laughs>